Chris Brown's Plug, a suffragette in North Wales. In 1907, 26-year-old Millicent Brown, who lived in Letchworth Garden City, joined the Women's Social and Political Union, the suffrage organisation founded in 1903 by Mrs Emmeline Pankhurst. The WSPU used militant methods in the pursuit of its goal to win votes for women from a reluctant Liberal government. These ranged from heckling MPs, deputations to the House of Commons, window breaking, damaging the contents of letterboxes, interrupting church services, and in the later stages of the campaign, arson and other destructive acts. Millicent herself was never involved in the more violent forms of militancy. Like many other women, she left the WSPU as militancy intensified. But in 1909, she was still working for the WSPU, attending meetings, going on demonstrations, speaking and organising activities in Letchworth. And like many other suffrage workers, she travelled around the country to give help wherever it was needed. I'm currently writing a biography of Millicent Brown, later Millicent Price, and in this talk I'm going to give a flavour of what suffrage campaigning was like for WSP organisers like Millicent by looking at one of her local campaigns. While travelling around organising, speaking and protesting was a life that took its toll on the women involved. Trains were late, luggage lost, accommodation dirty and uncomfortable, meals snatched at odd times, and the schedule of meetings was relentless, with hardly any time to rest. Often organisers were helped by local supporters, but sometimes they had to manage it all themselves. Sometimes, too, volunteers were unreliable, as Millicent was to discover. Overwork led to exhaustion and illness, which could be especially miserable if you were on your own in an unfamiliar place. What was more, as we'll see, the local political background could create specific difficulties. Some of the organisers were employed and paid by the WSPU, but many were, like Millicent, volunteers who had to pay their own way. They also had to manage the work alongside other commitments such as family or job. In fact, Millicent had to turn down an offer of a full-time paid post with the WSPU because she lived with her mother and couldn't leave her. Millicent was a teacher who spent her school holidays working for the cause, so she had to make sure she was back for the start of term. In 1909, Millicent was sent to North Wales by her friend and WSPU organiser Mary Gawthorpe to help make preparations for the campaign there. Holiday resorts were favourite settings for campaigns and all of the main suffrage societies sent workers to busy resorts. The WSPU urged its followers to volunteer to spend their holiday in holiday centres, paying their own expenses and giving as much time as possible towards helping with the campaign. The WSPU had another reason for descending on North Wales. David Lloyd George's North Wales constituency was Carnarvon Boroughs, consisting of Carnarvon, Bangor, Conoy, Nevin, Pathelli and Crickia. As Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Liberal Government, Lloyd George was a high profile target of WSPU militancy and he'd already had a great deal of attention from suffragettes. One of these incidents took place in June 1909 when he was speaking at the Welsh Nationalised Death Pod at the Albert Hall in London. He was interrupted and heckled in Welsh and English and a number of women were thrown out of the meeting. This episode was to have repercussions for Millicent and her colleagues in North Wales. Not only was Lloyd George immensely popular in his constituency, but this and incidents that later High Stepford die were seen as insults to the Welsh nation. As Lloyd George put it, when people go to their places of worship and disturb their services in the interest of women's suffrage and go to their national festival and disturb that, they create a quite unnecessary prejudice in the minds of the Welsh people against their cause. When Mary Gawthorpe spoke in Conoy a few weeks before her, her campaign with Millicent, she was interrupted by young men singing the Welsh national anthem, cheering Lloyd George and demanding to know why suffragettes had targeted the ice death pod in London. The men grew so unruly that the meeting had to be abandoned. A mob followed Mary to the railway station, but she managed to get away unharmed. The WSPU was left to pay the costs of damage, including wrecked furniture, in the hall in Conoy. <laughs> 
Mary planned to return to North Wales in August and at the end of July, Millicent was sent to Llandidno ahead of her to help organise her campaign. Millicent had a nightmare journey because she was suffering from terrible period pains. When she reached Llandidno, she went to see the local organiser whose name and address she'd been given, but found that she was very little help and couldn't even recommend a place to stay. Not knowing where she was to spend the night, Millicent left the house. Although it was outside licensing hours, she managed to persuade a publican's wife to let her have a glass of gin and hot water. Somewhat restored, she remembered a guest house she had stayed in on a previous holiday. She managed to find it, only to discover that it was full. However, the owner let her sleep in an armchair and the next day she found a room in a boarding house. Having secured accommodation, Millicent's next task was to organise indoor and outdoor meetings. This meant finding and hiring venues, obtaining any relevant permissions from local authorities, for example if speaking on the seafront, and publicising the meetings. Millicent also had to sell as many copies of the suffragette newspaper Votes for Women as she could. Millicent set up a meeting at the Prince's Theatre in Llandidno for 28th of July 1909 and had posters printed to advertise it. Unfortunately, the theatre management had heard about disturbances at recent suffrage meetings and, concerned about damage to the property, cancelled the booking. As if that didn't make things difficult enough, when Mary arrived, she told Millicent the lodgings in Llandidno were too expensive. Millicent was sent ahead to Rill to organise meetings there with instructions to make sure the rooms she found were cheaper. Indeed, Millicent did seem to be struggling to make ends meet. She'd spent all her own money and by now was having to borrow. In real, she also lost track of one of the women who was supposed to be helping her. She hadn't replied to Millicent's letter and it seemed she'd changed her lodgings without letting Millicent know. With the help of another volunteer, Millicent arranged a meeting in Rill Town Hall. She held a meeting on the beach to help publicise it. While she was speaking, a man waved a dead cat at her and shouted obscenities. On top of all this, the repercussions of the ice death fraud rumbled on. Millicent shared the meeting in Rill Town Hall where Mary Gawthorpe was constantly interrupted by protests about the London ice death fraud and noisy local liberals cheered whenever David Lloyd George was mentioned. While Mary stayed in Rill, Millicent and some companions went to Colwyn Bay to hold a meeting on the beach there. The other crowd became so threatening that Millicent had to run for safety. The promenade wall was too high for her to climb, but a group of sympathisers standing on the edge hauled her up and she continued her speech from the top of the wall. Then someone tried to push her off. She was saved in the nick of time by a local man who grabbed hold of her. At the end of her talk, she faced the usual questions about the ice death fraud. The meeting ended in a fist fight between a local heckler and one of the holiday makers. The next day, Millicent was with Mary in Llandidno, where they addressed crowds on the seafront. This was in defiance of the local council, which had refused permission for the meeting. Here again, Mary was grilled about the ice death fraud, but otherwise the meeting passed off reasonably well. Mary still had work to do in the area, but this was the end of Millicent's North Wales campaign, as she was due back in Letchworth. She had coped with period pains, venue cancellations, shortage of funds and the threat of violence. During her speech at Rill Town Hall, Mary had acknowledged her efforts, referring to the cancellation of the Llandidno meeting by the Prince's Theatre Management. She remarked, Miss Brown made all the arrangements for that meeting, but just because of the fear of consequences, the engagement was cancelled by the proprietor. It was a testimony to Miss Brown's pluck under such circumstances that she decided to come on to Rill. As Millicent Brown's experiences show, pluck was something a WSPU organiser needed if she was to cope with the stresses and strains of a local suffrage campaign. <laughs>